So uh, we began the study of the term deacon last week in the Scripture. We said that it simply means to minister or to serve, right? And as we began to look at it, we pointed out that it's a hard word to, when you look at it in the Greek, to tie down specifically to the office of a deacon because most of the times it's not talking about that. It's just talking about ministry in general. It's talking about serving in general. We saw it applied to the Lord Jesus when He said, uh, we, we contrasted the word uh, that's translated deacon against the word that means a servant or a slave. And so we read the passage, I believe it was in Matthew, maybe in Luke, it's repeated in a couple of the Gospels, where he talks about, you know, if any, if he that would be greatest among you, let him be your servant. And another verse says, let him be your minister. That was the two words, one word meaning slave, and the other word, uh, our word deacon here. And the Lord Jesus applied it to himself. I'm as, among you as one who ministers, um, one who serves. So we saw it applied to him, we saw it applied to the, the apostles, we saw it applied to the church in general, and then finally to this specific office of a deacon here in, that's listed for us in 1 Timothy 3. We'll read that text just quickly again. It says in verse 8, Likewise must the deacons be grave, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy of filthy lucre, holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience, and let these also first be proved, then let them use the office of a deacon being found blameless. Even so must their wives be grave, not slanderers, sober, faithful in all things. Let the deacons be the husbands of one wife, ruling their children and their own house as well. For they that have used the office of a deacon well, purchase to themselves a good degree and great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. And so, uh, like we did with the office of an elder, uh, we want to consider the office of a deacon in the same fashion. <laughs> When we studied the elders or pastors, the first thing we looked at is what is the elders' responsibility in the church of Jesus Christ? Uh, and so we looked at that, uh, kind of taking a passage in Ezekiel as, as our starting point there. And so we saw five responsibilities set forth for us, for the shepherds, for the pastors. And then we saw their uh, qualifications, which is what we have listed for us here in 1 Timothy 3. And then finally, we looked at the church's responsibility back to her pastors. And so we want to do the same thing with the deacons. Last week we saw what their responsibilities were. Uh, and just in case you weren't here, it was interesting. It's a, we didn't have a clear list of responsibilities the way that we do in, um, uh, in the study of a pastor. And let's just jump over to Acts chapter 6 and just review this quickly because we are going to refer back to this passage a few times as we, um, as we go through our study of the qualifications. This is really the first place we have in the New Testament church where this office is set forth for us, where these men are called uh, to this service. And we see a contrast here between the deacons and the elders among the church, the church's pastors. It says, and in those days, in, in verse number 1, when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. Uh, that word ministration there coming from our word deacon. Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. We said last week this is the verb form of our word deacon here, this word serve. And so there is a serving of tables, there is a ministry of tables mentioned in verse number 2. Uh, Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, uh, whom we may appoint over this business. Now notice the qualifications that are set forth for us for these men here. They are to be men of good report, of honest report, which are full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom. We're going to see that as we look at the qualifications in 1 Timothy 3 as well. Um, these qualifications are going to carry through. But we, he says in verse 4, will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry, the deaconage, if you will, of the Word. This is again a word coming from our word deacon here. And so we see a contrast. We see that there was a service, there was a ministry given to these pastors, the apostles, these elders, uh, and it was a ministry of the Word. They were to spiritually labor among the church. But the contrast is we need to find seven men, he says, that are able to serve tables because we're serving and we're laboring in the Word of God. Here is a natural need that's arisen among the church and we need faithful men that can attend to this natural service. So there's a distinction made there between the deacons and uh, the elders. Um, So what we saw last time was that there's no defined task when we look at the office of a deacon, right? What happened here in the early church? 
something popped up, right? There was an issue. An issue came to the forefront and he said, we need faithful men, we need men full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom to handle this matter. And so it was the need that really defined the office of the deacon here among them. They were called to this particular service to look out for these neglected widows. That's not always what's going to pop up within churches, right? And so there are needs specific to this assembly that may not be the same as the needs to this assembly over here. And so we saw that it's up to the church to recognize those needs and to appoint those that are faithful men to attend to those needs. So there were no clear-cut qualifications. They were simply called to serve among the body of Christ. So it's up to the church to recognize and define these needs even as it was done here. So now let's look at the qualifications of these men. There was a key word um, in chapter 3 of Timothy and verse number 8. At the very beginning there, there's one word listed. It says, likewise. Likewise must the deacon. So we're continuing this thought, right? We've set forth all of these qualifications of a, of a bishop, of an elder, of a pastor. And he says, likewise, in, that is in the same manner, similarly, right? We're going to set forth some qualifications now for this office of a deacon. And so what we're going to find as we go through here is that the office of a deacon, these qualifications are basically a subset of those that are set forth for the bishop before. With one uh, key distinction, and do you guys remember what it was? I mentioned it last week apt to teach, right? That's one thing that you're not going to see here in the deacon. And, th and that goes very well along with what we saw in Acts chapter 6. We're responsible for the ministry of the Word. God has given us this ability to teach and to shepherd the flock of Jesus Christ. We need men that can serve tables but are full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom to be able to attend to this natural need here. So that is one distinction that we'll find as we go through here. But let's dive into this, uh, these qualifications that are listed for us in 1 Timothy 3. The first qualification that we have of a deacon, likewise must the deacons be what? Grave. grave. The first word that we have is grave. This word is a variation of the word gravity that we have at the end of, of verse number 4. Under the qualifications of an elder, one that ruleth well his own house, having his children, children in subjection with all gravity. That is a, a variation of our word grave here. In verse number 11 in this same chapter, the exact same word is, is applied to the deacon's wives. Even so must their wives be grave. First qualification of the deacon's wives is also the first qualification of the deacon himself. And so they are to be grave. We won't go there for time's sake, but it is also a quality of the aged men in the church according to Titus 2 and verse number two, and then the young men in the church in that same chapter are said to possess gravity, the word that we saw up in verse number four of First Timothy three. Strong says it means honorable. These men are to be honorable, and some translations render it reverent because it comes from the word that means devout or worship. That's how it's translated in our King James scriptures. It's translated, the root word is translated devout, and worship. So here's the point that I want us to take away from this word grave. This man is a believer. This man is a devout worshiper of Jesus Christ. What makes him honorable? He's honorable because he possesses those characteristics that are, that, that are clear evidence of, the whole, of being a possessor of the Holy Ghost. This man is a true believer. He has that evidence of being a true believer. He is first and foremost a devout worshiper of God. This is very similar to what we saw when we studied the office of a bishop, and you probably don't remember it because of how many weeks ago it's been, but the first word that we saw in the office of a bishop in verse number two was that a bishop then must be blameless. And we said this word blameless here was unique. It is not the same word blameless that you find at the, at the end of verse number 10 in the office of a deacon being found blameless. It's a different Greek word. It's a much stronger word. And if you remember, we said in terms of the bishop, this word blameless means to not be seized. Not seized. He is a man that is not seized. In other words, uh, uh, what we saw with the elders is that the pattern of these men is that they are held captive by Christ and Christ alone. 
not seized by any desires of the flesh. Paul said, I, I keep my body under, right? And I won't be brought into subjection to any. And yet when he spoke about himself in relation to Jesus Christ, what did he say? He said, I'm a slave of Christ, right? That word, remember that word servant that's used so many times at the beginning of the epistles that Paul writes? A servant of Jesus Christ. It is literally the word slave. I am held captive by Christ and Christ alone. So this was the pattern of the apostle. He wrote to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 6 and, and 19 and 20. He says, Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own, for ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God uh, in, uh, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. You belong to God. You've been purchased by, that's slave talk, right? You've been purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ and you are not your own. You belong to Him. The apostle lived that way. These men likewise are to be grave. They are to be first and foremost worshipers of the Most High God. They are not held captive by any but God Himself. They see themselves as being bought with a price and they belong to Him. These men's lives say, Amen to that statement. I told you I wanted you to, to notice the qualifications that were set forth for us in Acts 6 and verse number 3. And, and what did Paul say whenever this problem arose? He said there's an issue and it's related to doing what? To serving tables. Right? There were widows that were being overlooked in the daily ministration as they cared for these elderly women that had nobody else to care for them. And he said, we need somebody that's able to serve tables. And so he looked over the congregation and he said, well, how many of you guys have been working in restaurants and know how to do this type of thing? That wasn't the qualification, right? He says, it may just be serving tables. It may seem like a menial task. It may seem like there's not you know, a lot of uh, head knowledge that's involved in being able to serve in this capacity. But this is a responsibility within the church of Jesus Christ. And so, therefore, we need to choose men that are of good report and men that are full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom. Because it's service within the church. And there's no small task when it comes to service within the church of Jesus Christ. These people are serving as representatives of Christ Himself. And so they must be full of the Holy Ghost. These men have a pattern of that. They have this pattern of gravity. You see, some churches, the tendency is, the tendency is because the responsibility that assigned is a natural task often, they look instead for men that are qualified naturally in that fashion. We need somebody to look after the finances, so this guy's an accountant. That's what he does in his full-time job, right? This guy's good with money, so let's appoint him over this task. Paul never mentions any of those natural responsibilities and qualifications. He says they need to be full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom. These are men that will represent Christ in His church. These are men that must be a believer above all, not simply a person skilled in that area. His character is far more important. Does he love the Lord? Is he a faithful worshiper? Remember when we looked at the elders, we saw this responsibility of feeding. When we looked at their responsibility, the first thing that we saw was feed my sheep. You tend my sheep, you care for my sheep. And how did they do that? Through faithfully giving them the word of God, preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. But if you remember, when we looked at the qualifications of an elder, this able to teach, this apt to teach qualification was number seven in the list. Because you're not to simply appoint a man because he's a good speaker, right? He's got that certain something and men are drawn and attracted to him, right? That's not the first and primary uh, qualification. First and foremost, he has to be not seized except by Christ himself. He's got to be a man that's blameless. And so we see that with the deacon here as well. He is grave. He is honorable because he is devout, because he is, above all, a faithful worshiper. Someone may be a great teacher but not qualified for the ministry because of the other more important things set forth for us there in those list of qualifications. Likewise, this man, first and foremost, must be a devout worshiper or he 
is disqualified. He has those evidences of being full of the Holy Ghost. Those fruits of the Spirit are clearly seen in him. The second qualification that we have set forth for us here in 1 Timothy 3 is that he is to not be double-tongued. Not double-tongued in 1 Timothy 3, 8. It literally, literally means not twice words. It is the word logos, the spoken word, not double in his speech. His speech should be marked by honesty and truthfulness. Again, this very much relates to the office of a bishop as we looked at that because so much of our study in that office had to do with what this man says, what this man declares with his speech. I told you we're going to go through the deacon much quicker because we've looked at these terms before, right? We've sort of uh, dived deeper into this in our previous study. So in a similar fashion, we said this is a subset of the qualifications of a bishop. In a similar fashion, this man must not be double-tongued. He must be sound and honest and truthful in his speech. The, the elder is a minister of the Word of God, which is the truth. Jesus said, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy what is truth? Thy Word is truth, right? So as the pastor is marked by truthful speech, so, so should the deacon be. Um, you'll find this word, we found gravity over there in Titus 2 applied to the young men. You'll find the phrase in Titus 2.8, that the young men should be of sound speech that cannot be condemned. That should be the case here of this man. He's an example to the believers that are in the church as one that uses his words wisely. Sound speech which cannot be condemned. These men are reliable. You can count on what they say. What they say, they will do. Right? You can count on their words. What they say, they will do. They are not hypocrites. The hypocrite says one thing and does another. Right? Uh, what they say to one, they will say to the other. That, that's what's kind of set forth for us with this double speech, right? You say something to one person, then you go over here to the other, this other one and, and say this. These men aren't like that. What you hear them say to one, that is what they say to another. Sound speech. When you hear them say that, you know that that is what they mean. That is the truth. They're not going to be something else to someone else. They can be trusted. Something that we note about the passage in Acts chapter 6. Why were these men chosen? What prompted the choosing of these seven men that we saw in Acts chapter 6? Need. There was a need, right? And it wasn't just simply a need. It was a need that had attached to it some bad feelings, right? There, there was a problem. You know, there was an issue among the church. They're, they're, they're being prejudiced against our widows, the Greek-speaking Jews said. Ours are being overlooked and, and theirs are being well taken care of. So there's an issue. There's a problem. Let me tell you something about problems in the church. They will happen. It's just going to happen. Paul said, I hear, I hear that there's a division, there's schisms among you, and I partly believe it. He said part of the, what, the, 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 what results from these divisions and from these differences that happen is that those that are truly of God are manifested in that. So the problems, they will arise. Jesus said it must need be that offenses come, right? But woe to the one by whom the offense cometh. And so problems will arise, and though they are uncomfortable, you know what problems do? They reveal needs. They reveal opportunities for service. They manifest those that are truly the Lord's. I wonder how much stronger you know, churches would be today if as soon as there was a problem, men didn't go running away. It's too easy now to just abandon the church and run away, right? Because we got a church on every corner. But you don't find that in the New Testament church. You had believers in Ephesus, and guess what? They were all together. You know, you had the, the believers in this region and they had to work it out. Paul labored among the Corinthian church. There are serious issues, but I'm not abandoning you guys and washing my hands of you. Let's get these things straightened out. Let's, let's, let's maintain unity. And so these problems revealed needs and they re revealed opportunities for service. So what prompted the choosing of these men? There was an issue. These men are often called to serve in difficult and touchy situations. Right? Right? And so they need to be men that are not double-tongued. They need to be men that speak wisely. What did Paul say? They're serve, I mean, Peter said they're serving tables, but they need to be men full of the Holy Ghost and what? Wisdom, remember? 
Men that know how to speak wisely. They don't add fuel to the fire in these delicate matters, right? The pot's already stirred, right? It's already a touchy situation. You need someone that's going to calm that down, not make it worse. So these should be men that are not double-tongued. Let's go to the book of James. They put fires out instead of starting them, right? In James 1, uh, it says something about uh, these men are to be full of wisdom. It says something about men that uh, seek wisdom. There is a certain kind of man that shouldn't expect to receive it. He says, if we lack wisdom, verse number 5, what do we need to do? Ask Just ask of God, right? This is, a, this is a request that God is pleased to grant. If any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not. He's not going to get on to you for asking. He's not going to chide you for asking. It shall be given to him, the one that desires it. But, verse number 6, let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man. This literally means a double-souled man. This is a man living two different lives. It's like the double-tongued man. He says one thing to one person and something else to someone, to another person. A double-souled, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. This is not a man that will possess wisdom. He won't receive wisdom even if he asks for it. He is unstable. He asks apart from faith. He wavers. And so these men must be able to speak wisely, not adding fuel to the fire. What does James say about the tongue in chapter 3 here? Look at James 3 in verse number 5. How important is our speech? And how much do the things that we say matter? This is a man that recognizes how important it is that we speak wisely that we be more ready to hear than to speak, right? Uh, chapter 3 and verse number 5 says, Even so the tongue is a little mem member and boasteth great things. Behold how great a matter a little fire kindleth. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members that it defileth the whole body and setteth on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire of hell." <laughs> this is not what we need when you've got a touchy situation in, a church, in the church, right? Someone that cannot control his tongue. We see how much damage the tongue can do. Just a little member, but it's like a spark that's, that sets ablaze. Uh, you know, the whole forest is burned down because one little spark started. These men are wiser than that. They use their tongues wisely to help in a matter, not to make it worse. Let's close with Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 16. We talked about a delicate situation, right? We talked about this problem that the church is on the verge of division. They're overlooking our widows. There are hard feelings at one another. We need men that are going to bring unity and that are going to handle these delicate matters wisely. Not a double-tongued man. Not a man that says one thing to one person and whispers something else to another. Listen to what a whisperer will do in Proverbs 16. He doesn't make the situation better. A froward man soweth strife, and a whisperer separateth who? Very friends. Chief friends, right? Those that are already friends. He causes more trouble, right? Where there wasn't even division before, now there is because a whisperer even separates chief friends. I want you to see the contrast as we close between the, in uh, Proverbs 10 between the one that knows how to use his words wisely uh, versus the one who is a fool. A fool, by the way, is known by his multitude of words. He can't be quiet. These individuals that are not double-tongued, that use their tongues wisely, they know when to speak and when to be silent. And verse 20 in Proverbs 10 says, the tongue of the just is as choice silver. The heart of the wicked is little worth. What was it that needed to happen in Acts chapter 6? The widows needed to be fed that were being neglected, right? Listen to verse 21. The lips of the righteous, what do they do? Feed, feed many. See, the, the words of the wise are tied to feeding, tied to being filled. But, the, but fools die for want of wisdom. So grave, these men ought to be grave. These, ought, these men ought to not be double-tongued.
hold on to those because uh, one of the things that we mentioned as we read this text is some have wondered, do the qualifications set forth of the wives there apply to the wives of the pastor or the wives of the deacons or both? And I think we're going to very clearly see if you hold on to these qualifications that it applies to the wives of the deacon. That's a word that's, that's tied to the wives of the deacons. But Lord willing, we'll see that in the coming days. Any thoughts as we close?